I'm joined today by John Dugar, Professor of International Law and former Special Rapporteur to the UN Human Rights Council concerning Palestinian affairs. Thank you very much for speaking to me today. Now, as a South African who campaigned against apartheid in your own country, you've spoken about a certain type of apartheid existing within Israel. Could you elaborate on that a little for me? Uh, increasingly, uh, Israel's policies in the occupied Palestinian territory are described as a form of apartheid. And like most South Africans who have visited the uh, occupied Palestinian territory, I do believe that there are great similarities between apartheid as practiced in South Africa and the policies pursued in the occupied Palestinian territory. Uh, first of all, there is discrimination. There are two groups. There are uh, Jews, settlers, and Palestinians. There are two separate legal systems for the settlers and for Palestinians. Secondly, there's clear repression. Uh, there is uh, torture applied in respect of Palestinian uh, militants. Uh, checkpoints restrict freedom of movement at every level. There's detention without trial. There are the same forms of political repression that we experience in apartheid South Africa. But would you say that there's a, a certain apartheid that exists within Israel, or is it just in the, the occupied territories? There is clearly discrimination against Palestinians in Israel itself, that is, uh, Israeli Arabs. But the distinguishing feature, or the feature that distinguishes uh, Israel from apartheid South Africa, is that Israeli Arabs do have the vote. Blacks did not have the vote in South Africa. And that does mean that if the Palestinian Arabs used their vote intelligently, they might constitute a major force in the Israeli Knesset. But we've seen with oppressive regimes like apartheid and others in the past that they've gone by the wayside. Why has this conflict between the Israelis and the Palestinians gone on for so long? I think the main reason is that Israel has the support, active support of the United States, and to a great extent the support of uh, the European Union and even the Russian Federation. One cannot underestimate the uh, Holocaust guilt factor, that in many countries, such as the Netherlands, for instance, Netherlands' foreign policy in respect of Israel is largely determined by the uh, factor of Holocaust guilt. In the United States, there is a powerful Israeli lobby consisting of the Jewish lobby and the evangelical lobby. Uh, Together, these forces within the Israeli lobby ensure that no action can be taken to compel Israel to comply with its international law obligations. Now, we're here in The Hague, the home of the International Criminal Court, and there has been calls for some Israeli officials to appear before the ICC. Why hasn't that happened? The situation is that in 2009, following Israel's invasion of Gaza, the Palestinian Authority accepted the uh, jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court and requested that the investigation be made into international crimes committed during that conflict and thereafter. But the prosecutor of the ICC does not have the courage to take action of this kind. And it's quite clear that this is because of the influence of the United States. The United States is not a party to the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, but its presence is ever felt. It does attend meetings of the Assembly of State parties. It makes its position clear. In which way does the United States exert influence over the International Criminal Court? Well, there is a uh, hope, an expectation, that the United States will join the International Criminal Court. The belief is that if uh, the International Criminal Court institutes an investigation, prosecution uh, into events in Palestine, that the United States will certainly not join the ICC. But I think it runs deeper than that. There is 
a reluctance on the part of international institutions and states throughout the world to take action on Israel because they know that this will offend the United States. So essentially the whole thing is somewhat toothless without the US. As I see the situation, the uh, International Criminal Court would also be competent to uh, initiate an investigation into the construction of settlements in the occupied territory. It's not necessary for Palestine to become a party to the ICC statute because it has already accepted the jurisdiction of the court. And I think that without firm action of this kind, uh, settlements will continue to grow until the uh, ideal of a two-state solution is completely destroyed. But what can the ICC do to stop the expansion of Israeli settlements? It's quite clear that Israel is in violation of international law on the subject. The European Union and the United States and other states condemn uh, the uh, extension of settlements, but they don't do anything about it. Uh, language is not uh, translated into action, and what one really needs is firm action on the subject of settlements. Uh, and I believe that if the International Criminal Court were to initiate an investigation, that would send out a message loud and clear to those Israelis responsible for the settlement program and for those settlers in the uh, occupied territory that what they are doing is an international crime. But what happens to the Israeli farmer that's worked hard over many years in some cases to build up a farm? Does he just lose his land, lose his farm? Well, I think it's essential to see Israel's settlement policy as a form of colonialism. So during the colonial period, Colonists settled in uh, territories, started farms and other enterprises, and when decolonization came, they had the choice. They either went back to the mother country or they stayed on and lived under the uh, new sovereign power. And that's essentially the choice that settlers will have. They can either go back to Israel or they, they continue can continue to live in a Palestinian state subject to the Palestinian government and Palestinian laws. It's their choice. Is settlements the major issue which has to be resolved before any kind of real peace talks can take place? Settlements are important because they do constitute a form of de facto annexation. Uh, today we have some 600,000 settlers in the Palestinian territory. They are taking more and more land. The result is that uh, the idea of a Palestinian state becomes non-viable. And what troubles me is that the present Israeli government does not see that its policies do not serve the best interests of the Jewish people. I believe that it is in the best interests of the Jewish people to uh, continue to build the state of Israel within the borders established in 1948-49 and to encourage the settlement or the creation of a Palestinian state nearby. But the, the present trend in uh, the region is uh, unfortunately in favour of an apartheid state. Do you think that the International Criminal Court has to bring prosecutions against people involved in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? I don't think that prosecuting Israelis is going to solve the political uh, problem. I think it simply sends out a message to Israel that the international community and its institutions see what Israel is doing as an international crime. That's the purpose of the prosecution. It's not for retribution and it will not settle the, the, the problem politically. There has to be a settlement and I believe the settlement or the rules for that settlement are fairly clear and most people agree that what one needs yeah. is a Jewish state within the 48-49 boundaries, a Palestinian state on the other side of the uh, region with East Jerusalem 
as its capital, and some compromise arrangement in respect of the return of refugees. I can understand that Israel finds it difficult to accept the notion that all refugees and their descendants should be allowed to return to Israel because that would flood the uh, state of Israel with uh, Palestinians. I can see Israel's point of view. So some compromise arrangement will have to be made in respect of uh, refugees. But the, otherwise, the, the lines are fairly clear. One needs two states with East Jerusalem as the capital of uh, Palestine. What are the main problems with achieving that two-state solution? Land is the determining factor in the Middle East. Israel wishes to expand its territory. And it does this by means of the expansion of settlements. It does this by constructing an alleged security wall within Palestinian territory, which has resulted in the seizure of Palestinian land. And we are going to see some form of uh, legislative control exercised over the Area C, that is rural Palestine by Israel. So in other words, we see de facto annexation of uh, Palestine taking place. And, and what is very sad for me is that this is so obvious but the international community turns a blind eye. The United States, the European Union, Russian Federation, China, the whole international community simply turns a blind eye to facts that are very, very clear. Professor Dugan, thank you very much. Thank you.